you know, when you're first being introduced to public health, it's all about statistics and and analyzing studies and that sort of thing. It doesn't really doesn't really do it justice to what what you can really experience there. I remember we had a lecture once on like crisis, emergency, and disaster. I was like, oh man, this is part of medicine. Like that's so cool. Like that's something I'm more interested in. Like you know, emergency and humanitarian response, that sort of thing. But I didn't really put together the pieces that it could all be part of one system. And yeah, like if you're not into public health at the start, I don't think you can really see its utility necessarily when you're doing the statistics, like the equations and statistics and, you know, re critically reviewing a paper. And you've got to push through all of that. Um, but, you know, like, you know, doing the first few years, you, you hear about public health. It's some mysterious things that sits out there outside of clinical medicine that works in some way. And, you know, yeah. So I guess you know you know about the basics of public health, like you know about social determinants of health and that sort of thing. But then, you know, for me going to Nepal firstly and just seeing like you're like you, you put the theoretical to the to the practical and you're like, oh my god, that equals that. If you can't regulate pesticides, people come in looking like that. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 85. Hi everyone, Amaya Richards here. Thank you all so much for joining me. Be sure to follow me on Instagram. That's at the PH Millennial. Be sure to subscribe if you have not. It greatly helps the show get out. And that's the easiest and best way that you can support this show is by subscribing or following if it's on, if you're on Apple Podcasts, but be sure to do that. If you have not as yet, leave a review as well. It helps let people know that the show is dope and uh, it's very helpful and informative for you and everyone else. If you want to, you can support at uh, thepublichealthmillennial.com forward slash support or buymeacoffee.com forward slash the PH Millennial. I really enjoyed today's episode. It was a very different story from many of the stories that I have had before, as well as his experience in Europe, as well as going in different places like Mongolia and Nepal. It was very fascinating and how that shaped his, his life and his perspective and the work that he does. And uh, I think you're all going to get a lot of value from this episode, and I hope you all enjoy. Today, we have someone who initially trained as a medical doctor, but upon completion of a double master's of public health and international public health degrees, decided to move into the career in public health. He's interested in international public health, especially outbreak management and disease control, infectious disease surveillance, urban health, environmental and climate health, as well as refugee health. He got his bachelor's of medicine, bachelor's of surgery at the University of New England in Australia, then got a double master of public health and master's degree in international public health at the University of Sydney, New South Wales. He currently works as both a public health senior medical officer at health service executive and a community building coordinator at Coalition for Global Health Innovation. And, and did I mention he lives in Dublin, Ireland? We have Dr. Kay Lola, MBBS, MPH, MIPH. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. It, it is my pleasure to have you. I've, I haven't had someone uh, who's living in Ireland. I've had a oh, couple really? Australians on though. So, yeah. so you're not the first Australian, unfortunately. No, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. I, I think that you have a very interesting story that I'm uh, looking forward to, to get to know and, and hear more about today. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess before we jump into anything, how, how is uh, everything going in Ireland, just generally speaking, during like this pandemic that we've been going on? Yeah, that's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, we recently got ranked as the, the best country in the world for managing the pandemic, uh, mainly because of our vaccine uptake, but still we're like looking at maybe some more restrictions coming soon. And um, yeah, it's just been a very long, long two years but besides that ireland's great it's uh it's been very friendly it's been very communal during this whole time everyone's pretty much united there's you know a few protests here and there but generally people are all pretty sensible and and right now it's getting into winter so we're getting quite cold and rainy which i personally love um so yeah we've got a big storm just about to hit the west coast tonight so you know 
ask me again tomorrow might be a different answer <laughs> well i hope that you're able to stay safe and uh, nothing nothing too bad happens yeah thanks thanks awesome awesome uh, so how how do you identify and then tell us a little bit about your personal background yeah sure sure uh, well, I guess pronouns are he and his. I think now I probably identify more as Irish than Australian, just in, uh, I guess, in in values. Um, so, yeah, I originally was born in Australia, just near um, Byron Bay, if people know that, kind of near Gold Coast and Brisbane. Grew up there, did all my schooling and um, university in my first few years of career work there. But um, having Irish ancestry and then, you know, feeling a bit, not really like I wanted to stay in Australia for a, you know, a number of reasons and climate and career and proximity to Europe and everything. I moved to Ireland, uh, you know, took up the offer, offer, took up the opportunity, I guess, using my, um, my Irish ancestry and moved over here. Um, yeah, a very big interest in, in public health, um, background in medicine, but yeah, it just wasn't really for me. I didn't feel um, clinical medicine, that is. So, yeah, moved into public health and been loving it ever since. Um, love to travel a lot as well so I think that all kind of links in together somewhere <laughs> okay awesome well, well thank thank you for sharing that uh, I, I love that and we're going to dive into a, a little bit more of those kind of those things that you mentioned there for sure during, during our time uh, in this interview cool cool um, so what does public health mean to you uh well yeah a few different things a few different things really I think the main thing is that public health is is probably doing all you can to enable people to you know live and be to their full potential usually you know traditionally that's meant protecting them as well as you can from infectious disease but i think now there's a lot of role for protect them from you know environmental hazards and um, want on destruction and all of that sort of thing but also you know enabling people to be mentally well physically active and and kind of not be um to try and reduce the effect of any social determinants of health really that's probably it um and with that you know built into that i think is just that that kind of quality of uh, equity for everyone it's about providing an equitable health enabling protection and promoting service to everyone something along those lines <laughs> Absolutely. I think it, it is probably like almost everything, if not everything along, along those lines. I think you captured <laughs> a very broad stroke and, and uh, we, we appreciate that for sure. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So, so I guess let, let me just jump into this. So how, how does, a, you got your bachelor's of medicine, bachelor's of surgery at the University of New England in Australia, just so people are clear. How, yeah. how does that work, getting your bachelor's of medicine, bachelor's of surgery? Like what's, what's that uh, logistically? Actually, it's pretty, it's all right. Yeah, so so five-year course um, in Australia. Well, for the undergrad course, it was a five-year. There are different types in Australia, but um, so I basically, I finished high school um, or secondary school and got a certain mark. I deferred a course for a year. I didn't go to university for a year, just kind of worked for a bit. And at the time in Australia, there was this thing where if you worked over a certain amount, earned over a certain amount in a certain amount of time, you could get government welfare when you're at university like you know government support so I did that uh, and then I with the score I got I was able to get into university into a medical course there it involved an interview and kind of like a like an IQ type test thing I don't know what you call it. like one of those logic tests goes mm -hmm. a logic exam goes for a few hours you know reasoning and critical yeah. thought and all that sort of thing yeah you know the one um, so I did that for a bit um, well, I did that once, um, got the score, passed the interview, which was good. And then, yeah, just dive straight into the course and it was an undergrad straight up five-year course. So I didn't need to change degrees. I didn't need to do anything else really. Um, and one of the good things about places like Ireland and Australia and that is that you have um, the courses are often a government subsidized. So um, I, I basically didn't pay anything to do all that university. Um, I left with a debt, but it's a debt with the government. It rises with inflation and all of that sort of thing. So, and it just kind of take automatically takes money out of your tax every year when you earn over a certain amount. So, I think for all of those reasons, it was quite easy. Like, <laughs> not the course necessarily, but that whole process of getting in, you know, with the mark I got and everything. Like, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do necessarily, but it, I don't know. Maybe I was just lucky that everything just kind of all generally worked. Um, so I did two and a bit years of uh, lectures, essentially, a bit of experience in hospitals. I uh, got 
the chance twice to go overseas with university placements. So I went to Nepal and Mongolia. Um, that was in my third and fifth year and then did two years of just hospital work. So it was, um, you know, full-time every day, but full-time being, you know, 30, 40 hours a week type thing. And then a few lectures here and there, a few exams. So yeah, half, half theoretical, half clinical. And at the end, obviously you got to pass all the hurdle exams at each point and then finish and you apply for your internship and get assigned somewhere and off you go. Okay. Okay. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you for walking through that process. And I'm just I'm like people who are, who are in the US listen to this podcast, first of all, the government paying for that much of your university or supporting you in that way, unheard of. But that, I think it goes to show that there are places that have policies in place that are doing right and helping people in a lot of different ways, as well as the streamlined process of getting a doctor degree. Like, it makes no sense in the US that you get like a bachelor's of biology and then have to apply again to go to, like, I know in Trinidad, it's pretty similar to how you explained it. It's very streamlined in, into the process. But yeah, I, I, I believe that those type, those there are some cons to it. Like, I guess if you change your mind, how, how does that work? Like, yeah. if you change your mind during that, I feel like you might lose something. But, but anyway, that, that is, that, we're, not, we're, not, we're, not here to, we're not here to talk about medical school, but thank you for saying that. <laughs> but was your thought process going into university thinking you, you're going to go to medical school and become a doctor? Or what, what was that thought process? Yeah, pretty much. Well, I guess like when I first, the first course I got into was biomedical science. And it's one of those things where you can, you know, if you're going well enough at one point, you can switch degrees. So I was originally planning to do that, but then I interviewed, I applied again the next year and interviewed again um, and then went from there. So I guess, I don't know, because I knew it would be one contained course. You didn't have to switch around. There weren't really options. If you, if you could pass all the grades and stayed with it, you knew you would come out the other side with a medical degree. Um, so I was aiming for that. I thought initially I'd try and be a GP in Outback Australia, but you know, things change quite fast so yeah within five years I'd, I'd turn that around and I was um, thinking more international based on probably based on those pracs that I did overseas but I'm um, thinking more international but then I went to the hospital and then so on and so forth and yeah it all, all got pretty interesting I yeah I just kind of realized I'd, I don't know we onto that section yet but I just kind of once I got into actual medicine in hospitals it wasn't exactly what I'd hoped really it was not as uh ethical as i thought maybe okay, i'll pause i'll pause things. there i'll pause there you, sure. you, 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 you give me give me more of that a little later yeah, yeah, i want to sure, hear sure, sure. i want to hear about um those experiences that you did have when you were able to to go to nepal and mongolia like how how right. how was that opportunity like presented to you and then what kind of stuff did you do there as well as what what did you learn what do you take away from that yeah uh, it was amazing life-changing really um so yeah there was like a, a dedicated block at the end of my third year of medical school where you had to do, you could do anything you want. Um, it had to be eight weeks. It had to be clinically supervised, but it had to be focused around health equity. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people, you know, stayed locally and went to a GP surgery or some people worked with like indigenous health in Australia. Um, some people worked with, you know, refugee health or something like that, but a lot of people went overseas. Um, so I, I don't exactly know how we organized everything. I can't really remember. <laughs> it's a few years ago now. But we managed to all meet in a group of uh, about seven other friends, I think, from medical school, all managed to organize to go to two hospitals in Nepal for uh, three weeks and five weeks. So we were in the first hospital, which was a public hospital in Pokhara for five weeks. Um, that was pretty brutal. Like, not for us necessarily, like uh, we were just observing, but the conditions were just, you know, something you read about that you can't really prepare for. And just, you know, seeing that was quite shocking, I guess, firstly. And then, you know, just when you put together all the kind of parts, you can see that I, I think that's probably where, you know, the inspiration for public health originally came from for me, just seeing what happens when you can't protect people at that very basic level. And then, of course, of course, those kind of countries, there's a lot of inability to kind of manage at the other end of the spectrum. There's not really the advanced services you need as well. But, you know, when you don't have that safety net of public health or, or equity or government support or anything, it just, it's just horrific. So we're there for five weeks, uh, eye-opening. 
and then we went for three weeks into a, a private hospital in in Kathmandu and that was a bit more advanced I guess um, wasn't as as kind of grass grassroots community hospital kind of thing but still still quite shocking to see a lot of the stuff um, and with that we got some opportunities to go up to villages and see how like tiny little rural clinics were doing things and how they kind of how communities will fund ambulances together and stuff like that all these really amazing things that I think are relevant now to public health you know I think about them daily and then with Mongolia um, that was another section where you had to I can't remember what that one was about and you just you know, had a, a few weeks to just do something <laughs> it had to be had to be rural I remember that it had to be rural health um, and I'd wanted to go for Mongolia for many years so I I talked to someone who knew someone who knew someone else and blah, blah, blah. And I ended up being getting onto this woman who worked with um, Save the Children, I think. And she came from this town where basically they were happy to have me. So I went over to this little village in Mongolia for four weeks. Um, didn't have internet or running water or toilets or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I was just there in the clinic every day this and there was like it was like a kind of just a walk-in clinic and you know they'd see things like you know someone with a swollen knee or there's someone would come in with like closed angle glaucoma or laboring or broken leg or something you know it's just all over the place yeah again very eye-opening partly because of the lack of not resources but like the kind of lack of, yeah, lack of health resources because it's just so remote you know if someone broke their leg which happened to the woman who organized my um her son a few years before if he broke his leg he got hit by a motorbike and had to drive themselves for out 14 hours to the capital things like that it's just mad um yeah so formative but um yeah just observing really got to do a few little practical things on all of those trips but mainly observing and taking it in like a sponge yeah i think that's awesome and that's that's awesome that they gave you those opportunities to to, to take on that and see those very very different lives that people live and have to like interact with and deal with yeah. on, on a on a daily basis that we don't even fathom or think about or see how fortunate we are in in all of the the instances that we do um how do you adjust to not having wi-fi toilets uh all the all the things that typical like millennials want <laughs> these days yeah well, that was in 2013, so I wasn't as dependent, I guess, on uh, constant Wi-Fi. Then I was plenty dependent on Facebook and things like that. But I don't know. I was prepared for it. Like I'd been told that there was no English and no water and nothing like that. I don't know. I saw it as a bit of adventure. Uh, so, the, so there's no English? So did, was there a translator? Uh, no, no. There was a few people here and there who knew English. So the two doctors were husband and wife who run, ran the hospital there and their daughter was also a fifth year medical student and was doing a prac as well. So she spoke quite good English. And then there was one English teacher, some English Mongolian app they managed to track down somewhere we used once or twice just to kind of compare words. And they mainly asked me about, you know, Mongolia and what I thought of it and everything, not anything <laughs> clinically relevant. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I picked up a few words here and there, nothing, nothing enough to really converse, but could talk about general, very basic things you could see. Yeah, I don't know. You, you kind of adapt. It, it was the hardest thing probably was um, I'm vegetarian. So, you know, being in rural Mongolia where they their <laughs> diet, I swear, has to be 95% meat. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. You know, some days where my, my breakfast and no lunch and dinner was just two-minute noodles and sausage. Mm -hmm. and so taking a whole tin of, like, protein and vitamins and stuff. And, yeah, it was just – I think I lost a fair bit of weight in that – four weeks um but i don't know it just you know i treat it like a i you know i like traveling a lot i like new experiences so i think that helped propel me along yeah yeah absolutely that's like the, the biggest way to delve yourself into a culture and, and into people and understanding what they're doing but kudos for you for doing that uh, that, that is awesome that is awesome <laughs> thanks, thanks thanks um so i wanted to ask like during your time like during medical school as well as going to the to nepal and mongolia did you know about public health or the word public health at that point in time? Yeah, like a little bit. It's, it's one of those cases where we did it in the first year as a, a subject we had to do. But, you know, when you're first being introduced to public health, it's all about 
statistics and and analyzing studies and that sort of thing it doesn't really doesn't really do it justice to what what you can really experience there i remember we had a lecture once on like crisis emergency and disaster i was like oh man this is part of medicine like that's so cool like that's something i'm more interested in like you know emergency and humanitarian response that sort of thing but i didn't really put together the pieces that it could all be part of one system and yeah like if you're not into public health at the start i don't think you can really see its utility necessarily when you're doing the statistics like the equations and statistics and you know re critically reviewing a paper you've got to push through all of that but you know like you know doing the first few years you, you hear about public health it's some mysterious things that sits out there outside of clinical medicine that works in some way and you know yeah so I guess you know you know about the basics of public health, like you know about social determinants of health and that sort of thing. But then, you know, for me going to Nepal firstly and just seeing like you're like you, you put the theoretical to the to the practical and you're like, oh my god, that equals that. If you can't regulate pesticides, people come in looking like that. Like and just to see such a vivid and a horrific example of the lack of public health just gave me such an appreciation for public health. So, yeah, I knew about it a little bit, but it was really brought home, I guess, when I saw what happens when it's not there. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. That makes sense. And you and you also, like, take it upon yourself to embrace yourself into these places where you can, like, learn beyond, I think, like, just medicine and just understanding cultures. And and I guess to your point, you you realize that there was this something else that was cool when you heard about the emergency management um, response, mm. as well as like going into these communities and seeing that there wasn't that basic infrastructure for them to actually uh, survive and thrive mm. and uh, not having the health resources, as you mentioned earlier on. Okay, so, so you you finish your, your bachelor's, bachelor's, yep. and then so <laughs> you become a junior medical officer at NSW Health. I'm guessing that's the yep. national health. Uh, it's the state health, so New South Wales state health. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so how, how talk, talk about the process of getting into that and then, yeah, we can go from there. Yeah, sure. Well, again, uh, it was very streamlined, which was nice. In Australia, you know, there's a, there's a bit of an imbalance between not having enough doctors in places um, and particularly rural places. So the town I was from, the region I was from was classed as a kind of a regional place where you know they needed doctors and they always needed a constant stream of doctors to tra and to train and work and stay and all of that sort of thing so um there's a nice process there when i was doing the application and finishing internship where uh, if you're an intern that finished studying that year you go into a general pool you can put in preferences and they'll try and match up as many preferences as possible but basically if you had finished that year you were guaranteed a job at the end in the state if you went to a different state, it was a little bit different. And if you, I think since there's been some controversy because international students who pay a significant amount more to study in Australia weren't guaranteed a place. So that's happened since. But at my time, you were guaranteed a place. And then if you chose to go to these 11 or so rural hospitals, you'd actually have an interview for those and you could put in a preference and you'd be there for two years. You get a certain type of contract and everything. So my hospital was one of those my not my hospital my region was one of those and the hospital i end up doing all my clinical work in uh was one of those so i applied did the interview actually did the interview on the phone in mongolia I'm, you know trying to escape all these like school children who were like seeing me and they always used to come around to play and i was always trying to escape them trying to do an interview like running across the fields but um, <laughs> but yeah i did the interview and i i got accepted in um, i think being from there helped a little bit um, and then, yeah, I started in the start of 2014. And yeah, it's, it's just a nice way to be. It's very supported. Like it's extremely supported. There's a lot of strong labor laws, meaning you can't work more than, you know, you can't work more than 40, 40, 48 hours a week or something like that. You can't work more than a 16 hour shift. You need a certain amount of break time in between two shifts. You, you need a certain amount of protected teaching time. You can't do certain things on your own. Everything's supervised. So you're not, you're not left on a ward by yourself to deal with critically ill people on a 36-hour shift, which does happen in places like Ireland, unfortunately. Um, but in Australia, it's not like that, at least at that hospital. And that hospital was very good as well. It was very proactive in, in encouraging people to study and support people to you know, 
do things on the side and, and worked with them quite a lot. So I was very like, again, I was just very lucky throughout the whole process really. Um, yeah, so, and then, yep, just went through that. And eventually after the year, I passed everything well enough for the internship. So I graduated from internship and got a full general registration. Awesome. Well, that's good that they have everything in place for those kind of doctors. So, all right. So you were a doctor for how long? And then you, you were kind of like disillusioned by the practice of medicine <laughs> in a lot of ways that people probably don't even think about. So I want you to share about your, your story and your experiences. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, um, so yeah, I worked like I worked in that hospital until, and a few other hospitals, but I worked in that hospital for five years or up, up until 2019. And, it, you know, it was great. Like, I loved my colleagues. The work was stimulating. But I think, I don't know, there's just something a bit different for me personally about what I thought medicine, clinical medicine in the hospital would be when I started medical school and when I left um, medical school and then compared to when I was working. I often found that I thought patient rights weren't at the center of what people were doing. I saw instances where you know the whole process around consenting for an operation was not really necessarily done that well you know the process around involving a patient in their own decisions about whether they get a certain treatment a certain intervention a certain surgery dialysis you know ct scans whatever those sorts of things it wasn't really as balanced as i would hope and then i did a few choice rotations like you know i did a renal renal medicine rotation i know if you if we all know renal renal doctors are known for being very specific about management of their patients and very protective so you know it was just it was a bit micromanaging of someone's life for me and often you know i could feel and see that the patients weren't necessarily happy um not necessarily in you know, of themselves because they're in these awful situations but also you know we were at times you know like, you tell we were like convincing them of something they didn't really want to do. Maybe they knew that it was what should be done, but you know, it, it just didn't feel as helping all the time as I thought. Obviously, there's you know so much good, and I'm brushing over so many incredible and amazing and worthy things, but I just didn't really love that part. Um, I think you know, something in me, you know, when I was when I was heard about you know disaster and emergency response medicine, there's something in that about having such a wide broad kind of approach to things i don't really like getting bogged down in numbers and details and things like that so you know trying to juggle someone's potassium levels and that really wasn't for me it didn't really excite me that much whereas you know looking at how uh, hiv programs rolled out in the country that really does excite me so you know there's something kind of there set up which made me i guess a bit more receptive to not wanting to work in a hospital uh, yeah basically yeah. that <laughs> yeah 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 well, th thank you for sharing and uh yeah I, I bet that you did have a lot of amazing experience but i know when people get that that public health bite you know that they, they just want to yeah. want to see yeah. how they could uh effectively like make bigger changes to, to improve health exactly and exactly yeah just, yeah. yeah yeah so so i i appreciate you sharing that a lot <laughs> Okay. So, so when, so during, cause I know you were still a medical doctor while you got your master's degrees. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. when in that process and was there like any, like one moment that were like, all right, I gotta, I gotta go get my master's of public health and master's degree in international public health. I don't know if there was one moment. I think it always kind of been on the cards. Uh, I'd been looking at it and, you know, I like studying. I like studying in general and learning. So I don't know if there was one moment, but I, again, I still think back to Nepal and I, I think something must have triggered there into thinking in the future I should do public health, just kind of putting it all together. I don't know. I do remember like applying, but I, yeah, I think there must have been a point where I was like, I should, I should look into public health next year, into, you know, doing a course. Um, and so I, I looked into it and I, I worked out, I think the deadline was, you know, coming up or something like that for applying for the, the universities that did it in New South Wales. So, you know, there were University of Sydney, University of New South Wales and a few others. And I went to University of New South Wales. And again, very nice process, streamlined, government supported, that sort of thing. But yeah, I got into the course and I was like, yeah, this will be exciting. So I was very excited for it. Again, it was just like a kind of gradual step-by-step -step process. It wasn't a striking kind of moment, but still, 
uh, got there. But yeah, I started it. I don't know. Do you want to hear about how I went about it? Was that part of it as well? Or? Please, please. Sure, okay. sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so I was doing it remotely through University of New South Wales. So Sydney is about nine hours south of where I lived or a one hour flight. So I didn't have to really do much in person. I think I had three weeks in the one and a half years where I had to kind of be there for, you know, intensive schools or something, you know, the setup lectures and then the, all that. But they were very flexible again in that I could just, I got an administrator from work to supervise me doing one of my exams at work. Like, you know, just like I took off work, obviously, but <laughs> took time off work, was in office in the hospital. One of the admin was doing her work and just making sure I wasn't cheating or whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I did all my exams like that. Other exams were mainly assignments or multiple choice. Yeah, a few intensive schools across the way. Got to choose really interesting courses. You know, I did a course on uh, yeah, humanitarian response and response to emergency. Also did a course on bioterrorism, did a course on policy, policy like health policy, those sorts of things, which were all really good. And then I got to, so I was doing a master's of international public health, I think it was the first one. And then as I was coming up to the end, I remember thinking that like, I didn't really want its end. <laughs> I, the, like I was like there has to be more and I was like looking through the course catalog and I'm like that one sounds so cool like I really want to do that and then I found this thing where and so I'd done the eight eight units or whatever over one year and you could add on four units which is six months and make it a double degree so I added on a master of public health by doing an extra six months um, and at that point it had been really flexible like I did I think I did like three units and three units and two units. So like it was kind of like half time remote university for the first year. And then for that uh, 18 month period um, in the course, I, I was working as a locum, which is kind of like casual working as a doctor. Um, so I had a lot more time off and got paid a lot more and could study on the side. Um, so it was really enabling in that, in that respect as well. Again, maybe just really lucky. Um, and yes, and then I finished it off in 2016. Good as you for like wanted to learn more and like, oh, the uh, Masters of International uh, Public Health is learning. What else can I do? And you find the MPH <laughs> as well as as well as being able to do it a lot like quicker than typically, which is which is awesome. So you did that in one year and one and a half was both for both degrees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's it's great. It's, it's just nice that they they that's how their program work because there are definitely a lot of masters out there that have two years for the one master. So. Yeah, no, it's just it's just nice. It's packed in. Yeah, that was awesome. What is an intensive school? <laughs> um, I think it's just, you know, basically what we just would have probably called class back in university. <laughs> um, except that, you know, I was working. I had to take the time off work, fly down to Sydney and just spend all day kind of in lectures. Um, yeah, basically that. Not too much, really. It wasn't really that intense. You know, you'd be there until four in the afternoon or something, but drinks afterwards you know no, nothing really about it was that intense but i think it's just they call it okay okay did you have any concentrations for either or both of these yeah no no uh, no not really that was one point i was thinking i could add this kind of like little title on it that was called like professional of health safety or something like that but it didn't really work out like I was, I was approaching it from a very international and humanitarian response point of view um, and just the yeah, international health, global health kind of point of view, but it didn't really pan out like that. And I didn't get any title to that effect, but uh, that's kind of the way I was looking at it. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so how, how long after completing this double degree did you like stop working as a doctor fully and do public health if, if that's how it works out or tell, mm. tell me about that well I so as I said I was doing that casual doctoring thing locuming mm -hmm. is what we mm -hmm. call it in Australia here we call it agency I don't know I don't know that term um, but I was doing that so I was kind of working part-time I guess at the start of 2016 and I'd take long periods off to travel or do whatever so in 2017, I did my first kind of public health volunteering. And I, I kept working full-time as a medical doctor, mainly in that hospital from where I am until 2019, like August 2019. So also that period, I still was kind of like employed um, and working there and doing 
hospital medicine as my main job. But then my first full-time job in public health was in public health research in Ireland after I'd arrived. So started that uh, three months after I arrived here. And then when the pandemic started, I got a job in public health medicine. Have a look back. Okay, awesome, awesome. We're going to get to those as well. Okay. Cool. And you were also a public health analyst at the Georgian Harm Reduction Network. And this was in, I, I should have probably looked this up, Sibili, is it Tbilisi, Bil, uh, Bil, Georgia? <laughs> Sibili, so, yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry. There you any go. Georgians out there. <laughs> <laughs> You're very close. It was really good effort. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes. Tbilisi. Yes, yeah, so how, how do you come across that and then what do you do in it? Um, so, yeah, at the when that again like there was that time period where I was locuming so I was traveling a lot but I was thinking that you know I should combine this travel with some public health work because the world is grand I want to eventually get into public health I should probably get some experience so when I was kind of thinking about what I should do I was thinking that you know I'm interested in bloodborne diseases and infectious disease control and I'm also quite interested in the culture and history and travel and politics and everything of Russia and Eastern Europe and Balkans, Caucasus. And I know that, you know, the ex-Soviet countries are one of the only places on earth where HIV and hepatitis is rising. Um, you know, most other places are coming down with antiretrovirals and better public health, but for a number of reasons, those countries, a lot of those countries are going up. So I managed to stumble across a website that had a list of NGOs and their contact details in, you know, like Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Georgia. And you could only email three, three a day. So I systematically went through and emailed all of them. There was about a hundred of them over what, a month or something like that. And a few replied, one in Tajikistan replied, this one in Georgia replied, one in Southern Russia replied. There wasn't a great, a great response rate, but um, the one in Georgia, Georgian Harm Reduction Network, the director there replied to my message and I'd initially said, you know, like, I'm, you know, this is my background, I'm in medicine, I'm very interested in public health, I'd love to come over and just do like a month or so of just volunteering and um, seeing what you do and how you do it and everything. And then she, she was like, oh, let's talk on Skype. And jumped on Skype that night and she was like, yep, when do you want to come over? And like, you can't come over in September, but any other time of the year is great. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll be there in June. She's like, okay, great, see you then. And, you know, arranged everything. I did some traveling before that. And then just, um, I arrived there. I had the address. I rocked up and just started, started there for a month. Um, what I was doing mainly was around like uh, statistical analysis of some of their um, harm reduction programs. You know, they do a lot of that harm reduction stuff around drug use and that in Georgia. Um, Cause yeah, you know, hepatitis, HIV and criminalization of drug use and not very, um, not very robust kind of public health and clinical health systems to deal with um, bloodborne diseases it means that NGOs are kind of filling the gap um, at the moment. So I was doing part of their analysis they were doing, which is looking at like the difference in awareness of HIV and hepatitis risk factors and things like education and awareness of how to treat an overdose and that. Um, they were doing analysis of that. So I helped out with the statistical analysis of that, but also as a native speaker of English, I helped write a manuscript, which eventually got published um, for them. Not that they hadn't published things before, but it, I think it just helped out a native speaker. Um, also with that, you know, we uh, had opportunities to go to other nearby NGOs and see like how they do the voluntary counselling for people who have work concerns about HIV or hepatitis. We've got to go to like the uh, mobile ambulances that go around and do the pop-up testing in places where people who use drugs might congregate, um, you know, handing out naloxone, doing point of care testing for HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, TB, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, it was mainly that, just kind of getting a flavor, I guess, for what they were doing and how they were doing it in a country where the resources are not the same as you know, a Western country but also, you know, what they do with the resources they do get um, and just seeing kind of how they fit into the grander scheme of things and what kind of influences population health from the, from the top. Yeah, that's most of it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. And kudos to you for first of all, emailing all 100 organizations <laughs> <laughs> and, and 
that's really awesome that that uh, she was just so willing to just have you come and do the work. How how long so, were you, were you there doing that work? Uh, so I was in 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 place there in Tbilisi for a month, and then I continued working for with them. Well, I was there in 2017 in June, and the the study got published in the start of 2019. So it was that month there. I went back for another few weeks in 2018, but you know, still working remotely with them over that kind of two year period. Um, and actually do still kind of work with them now. We also published something recently with them. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we keep in touch. Uh, I chat to them quite often. Yeah, so still working with them, but it was actually, I'd say what, six or seven weeks all up in Tbilisi over 2017 and 18. Okay, that, that's awesome. Do you remember the name of that website that, that you had the, those organizations on by chance? I think it was maybe, uh, a F- a few uh, a f e w which stands for I don't know what it stands for but it's one of the main coordinating bodies for bloodborne diseases in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Russia a f e w dot org I think it is okay awesome I will look that up and I'll put that in the show notes for anyone interested because that is an awesome opportunity and uh, people have to reach out you, they said you said that there wasn't like a high response rate so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. That's awesome. And then you you also was a volunteer aid worker at, I'm going to mess this one up as well, drop in, I have it. Is that, is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that's Norwegian, <laughs> so I don't really know either. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so t- tell me about that, that work that you did there. Uh, again, another one, because I'd organized the volunteer kind of period in Georgia. So, and I also knew that I had a quite an interest in refugee health. Um, that volunteering in chaos in Greece with Trapani Havit, which means drop in the ocean, apparently in English. Um, it it wasn't like a health volunteering thing, but it was just kind of um, helping, you know, distribute food and aid and all of that at a refugee camp in Greece. Um, so I knew that I was going to be in Georgia in like the middle of June. Um, and I knew where I'd be at other points. So I, I, and I found this organization as one of the ones where you could kind of turn up, didn't need any particular skills in, in humanitarian response or anything. And you could do a specified period of, you know, two weeks or however long you wanted. Um, so I found them, I just said, can I come for these dates? You know, I'll, I'll, I can come to Greece and be there for these dates. And they said, yep, great. So again, just another thing, I just turned up on the, on the dates and, just was there for two or three weeks, I think it was, in the in the camp there. And then from Greece, I went straight to Georgia. Okay, that, that's awesome. And like a simple email uh, to, and, and like yeah. insights to people who, who might be trying to get like crazy internships or jobs in like Eastern Europe or everything, but just emailing people, I think is a good insight. And then you never, you <laughs> yeah. never know who will yeah. respond yeah. and who will give you an opportunity. <laughs> For sure, yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah, well, kudos, kudos for you once again. I'm like mixing that oh, into to your travel and things, which I'm going to ask you a question on about later. So after this, you were obesity policy research assistant at the University of Col- University College of Dublin. Uh, yeah. So how, how does that work? Yeah, um, so when I got to Ireland, my medical registration took a fairly long time to switch over. So in that waiting period, I needed to find a job. Again, I when I left my previous work in Australia, I thought Australia's that way. That's why I'm pointing out. Um, I thought, you know, this is my chance to kind of get into public health and, you know, with Europe being so small comparatively, um, it's, I think it's a bit easier place to do that sort of thing. So I was just looking for public health jobs. I was entertaining the idea of medical jobs and all of that as well, but I was mainly looking for public health. So I applied for a heap of jobs when I got here. Um, I interviewed for a few and I got that one at UCD, the University College Dublin. Um, and it was just, a, it was a fixed term contract. Again, centered around one project looking at um, obesity policies on the island of Ireland. So Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland is a joint kind of food safety group that works over the whole island. Doing a big survey that would be rolled, rolled out across the island to a thousand people you know, looking at what they thought about different possible intervention, policy interventions for obesity on the island based on like new, new research and all this sorts of things and on the back of another study. 
from a few years ago. So I was working a lot doing the kind of setting up of that um, study survey, um, you know, talking to stakeholders and organizing things and kind of finalizing a, a script, a, a survey. And we were all ready to go with the surveying company on something like March 19, um, 2020, 2020. Uh, and then I think it was March 13 that everything got locked down and the project continued on without me eventually. Uh, I, my contract finished and I moved on. But I, I've been told, I think, now that the research has been finalised and we recently had something, a side project from that published as well with the, that body that oversees the whole island, you know, the food safety across the island. So um, that's good. That's been good. But yeah, it was it was fun there. You know, I was working in a school, I was working in a university in a school of public health. So there was um, a lot of a kind of academic environment, but there was also, you know, the opportunities on the side to do you know, teaching um, and tutoring, things like that. Um, and I've actually been recently doing some of that as well which has been kind of nice um doing helping with the masters of public health there so yeah it goes around and comes around <laughs> yeah that was basically that i i yeah it was the job i found when i was here and i was very lucky i did okay awesome awesome well, thank you for sharing that as well and okay so going go back to one of your jobs that you work in currently you are a public health senior medical officer at the health services executive so how do you come across that and then what do you do well, yeah, so that, that job is actually what I was eyeing up before I even left Australia by a few months. So I was looking at that at the start of February 2019, um, and I got here in August. Um, so that job is kind of the, the public health medical job for someone who's not training in public health or a specialist in public health in Ireland. So the HSE is like the health services executive is the HSC, which is like the British NHS. Um, so it's the national health body. And yeah, I've been looking at it. I've been kind of working towards it. I was thinking I, by the time I got to Ireland, I would have all the, quali like all the qualifications and time, and the experience in time um, that I would need. And I, but I also need the medical registration. So that took a while to switch over. And I'd been talking to, like I had that job at, at UCD in research at the time, but I'd been talking to the people in like HR and administration and talked to some of the managers here in the public health department, how I would do it and when I could apply and everything like that. And then the pandemic came and I had already talked to these people. And so I was like, look, if you need someone, I'm, I'm more than happy to be involved. And they said, come tomorrow and got trained up with everyone else and just started you know furiously answering phone calls and trying to track cases and all of that right at the start of the pandemic so you know i'd been so excited for st patrick's day having <laughs> moved here and my st patrick's day was spent in an office working <laughs> with completely empty streets around but yeah um, that was right at the start of the pandemic i when that kind of first wave died down as I was working as an agency staff, they kind of kept the core staff. I ceased working there then and went back to the other research position. But then a kind of a few six month temporary contracts came up. So I switched over then because it just the timing worked just too well with my finishing the other job. It was just, I don't know how these things keep happening, but it does. Um, so yeah, and then I, I moved into there in, in July last year and I've been there full time since. Um, so. I guess what, what you would have done before the pandemic was kind of respond to all of the public health notifiable diseases that are reported in, in Dublin, I guess, because that's my area. So, you know, things like um, hepatitis or HIV, um, certain types of, you know, like um, Shigella and Salmonella and typhoid and certain types of E. coli. You know, if people get a lab notification of one of these, someone like me who rings them up and finds out what kind of water they were drinking and what food they were eating and who they've been traveling with where it would have come from and I'm also trying to trace forward anyone we need to test or things like that that's what it would have mainly been and about maybe five percent of my work is that and the other 90 percent is COVID so a lot of it is trying to control outbreaks in schools and factories and everything Every, every conceivable like kind of location try to deal with COVID cases in it. We, you know, ring cases and 
tell them guidelines to follow, that we interpret results and that sort of thing. But what I've really been loving lately is that we've also been able to get more into an environmental health. So we help consult with, you know, Dublin City Council and their air quality protocols and, you know, comment on national policy. You know, we do respond, they, the government puts out, you know, a public consultation, like we're making this policy, what do you want to see in it? And as a group in the Department of Public Health, we put together a response. So we did a great one recently on like the national anti-racism plan. Uh, we did some for like county development plans for Dublin and Kildare. Uh, we're doing one soon on like the, the, um, the upcoming kind of 20 year plan for Dublin transport. So yeah, just all sorts of things like that. It's getting more and more varied, but it's all quite incredible. Okay, that, that's really interesting. And I appreciate you sharing that. And I think like something that I want to highlight in there as well is like you said before moving from Australia to come to Dublin, uh, you were very interested in this rule and you knew what yeah. the qualifications are and you're like, all right, let me do the things to, to get to what I need to be to get this type of rule that I want. Unfortunately, the pandemic came and kind of like switched up what your general responsibilities would have been. But uh, yeah. regardless, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to like do that work and get the role that you were aiming to get which, which must have been awesome but what was that like to start starting this new role and just like jumping into this pandemic that was kind of like unknown at, at first yeah it was it was pretty wild um i guess you know a lot of people back then everyone everyone really didn't know what to expect it was a bit of a scary time and you know talking to people on the phone those first few days and weeks you know people were terrified um you know, you'd have people crying because you know, they were a close contact and things like that. You know, it's just it was awful. From that point of view, it was really quite scary and awful. But from a personal point of view, you know, like it always sounds very strange to say, like, I, I don't want to say I've benefited from the pandemic, but, you know, like it's been very instructive. It's been a lot of experience. Um, it's been, you know, learned so much about public health and myself and my professional skills and everything. Um, so at the start, you know, there was that kind of element of like crisis, like, oh my God, what is happening? Like, what are we in for here? But also, you know, that kind of sense of personal achievement that I could be someone who they wanted to take on to help out with this. And, you know, those first few days where, you know, we we're just ringing cases, looking at the guidelines, have you traveled to this country, to this country, where were you there? And doing all that travel tracing and all of that. It was, it was definitely a big change from whatever, I, from anything I'd done before. It was very novel and felt like real public health work. Um, but again, I don't want to say it was all, all glorious and everything like that because it was quite a scary time. But I guess it felt nice that I could be, you know, like, you know, as a healthcare worker, as a public health worker, it's, even though it's generally people's crises and everything you're dealing with, it, it feels nice to be able to provide that service to be someone who knows what to do and to help people. I guess it was nice from that point of view to like be able to help advise people doing that kind of the thing you do in, in, in healthcare work where you reassure people and you, you provide them with facts and you tell them it's going to be okay. It was nice to be able to do that and combine that with public health. Yeah, and, and to that point, it, like, it's a very sad reality, but it was like one of the, an exciting time for a lot of public health professionals in the sense that they've gotten to use their skills, although it's a very sad time in the sense that a lot yeah. of people have lost their lives, continue to lose their lives. Mm -hmm. And um mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot that, that goes into there as yeah. well. And as we continue to, to deal with coronavirus and what it is going to be and continue to be with, with our lives going forward. Yeah. yeah. And how, how, how does this work combine? Like, how, how do you, because you still work with the uh, George, Georgian Harm Reduction Network, right? So is it like yeah. you, you call in with them every month or so? Or like, what, what was that work like looking now for you? Mm -hmm. So with them, um, I, I, so I work full-time. I work, you know, uh, I'm contracted for 37 hours. Sometimes it gets up to 45 or something like that, which, you know, it's only like a quarter of the week in hours, really. But it takes up most of the, every, every work day. I'll work every second or third week, probably third or fourth weekend, really. Um, and, you know, sometimes some overtime here and there. With, with the Georgian Harm Reduction Network, you know, we... We would chat infrequently. I guess when we had that recent kind of study we were putting together, I started working on that maybe like July last year, just do a few hours every now and then, you know, a few hours over a week for 
one or two months to kind of get together the basics, send it around for revisions, you know, get the comments and a few hours here and there the next month kind of putting together the comments. So, you know, that, that took over a year or something, you know, some hours, but it was just, it's kind of infrequent and mainly in between kind of putting together something or in between being in Georgia, I would just be kind of maybe socially staying in touch with everyone there. Um, not actively working, but you know, if they if they you know, come to me tomorrow and they're like, we've got this this data, do you want to help us put something together? I'd be like, yeah, let's go. Um, but there are other things that um, I'm sure we'll talk about where that also take my time on the side and they're a bit more regular. And yeah, that that takes a bit that takes much more regular time and a bit more of my time, but also very excited. Yeah, and I'm guessing you're talking about the community building coordinator at the Coalition for Global Health Innovation, which I believe you, you are emailed being said it's situated in Sweden, but yeah. works out of somewhere else or something like that. Hey, so you, yeah. you can tell, tell me more about that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's a, it, I think it was established during the pandemic, or at least the, the ideas for it, the main bulk of them, everything was established during the pandemic. So it's always been kind of a remote organization. It's registered as an NGO in Sweden, but the the president the current president happens to be Swedish I think that's like she's a big driving force behind it so it's easy to register it there the vice president is English but living in rural France the ex president who is now like partnerships leader is in Belgrade in Serbia um, there's a few in the U.S. there's some in Mexico in China Egypt um, you know through Central Europe some Russian people. Um, some in Africa, not so much in Australia, but yeah, they're just everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, and it's 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 a lot of fun. So basically, it's an NGO focused around innovation in global health, um, and doing that by getting young young professionals in global health or basically any field who are interested in global health and seeing if offering them a platform to bring their ideas of global health innovation and trying to get a project up and running, essentially. That's the main thing, but you know, we also kind of make articles, like produce global health content, advocate, partner, partner with other NGOs, engage an audience. We try to engage an audience. <laughs> <laughs> and how how long have you been been in this position as well? Um, we're coming up on a year in February, I think. Um, okay. Again, I I was just on a. I have a good colleague of mine who uh, works in the HSC with me in public health. Um, originally from South Africa, but he is an extremely knowledgeable guy and used to work at WHO and um, uh, UNA, UNAIDS, UNITAID, UNITAID, the UN aid um, network, also with CHAI, the Clinton Health Access Initiative. So he did all these great things and then settled in Ireland a few years ago. Uh, he's just incredibly talented and smart. So I, I jumped on, I got, he invited me on one of his um, kind of webinars he has. He has his own global health channel which is quite big it's huge it's amazing <laughs> but invited me on one of his talks there and the other person was the um the the then president of cghi which is Jovanna from serbia so yeah. yeah we got chatting and and i at the time and still am i was learning well, croatian which is very related to serbian so i was very interested to talk to her from that point of view and then it turns out you know she was running this global health ngo and i was like oh god this is perfect i'm you know can i be involved and just kind of went with there, went from there rather. And they had a position as the community building coordinator. So I took that on. Okay, man, that, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, the opportunities is coming all, all over the place. And also also <laughs> yeah. asking for them though. <laughs> I guess, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And you also asked for it in, in Croatian, you said? Uh, well, I do. Croatian's very basic. So <laughs> I, but we had, we, we sometimes exchange a few words in Croatian. I've still got to get, to a much better level before I can be conversational, but I'm aiming for it. Okay, okay. And how, how, how many languages do you speak? Well, only one fluently. Okay. Uh, so I normally only <laughs> say one, but I'm learning, I'm learning three, technically. But just, they're all going very slowly. I kind of hope that maybe in five or 10 years, I might be at an acceptable level. I've got, I, I think I've got realistic goals, <laughs> hopefully. Okay, okay, that's good. And what, what are those three languages? Uh, so, First one's like Croatian, Bosnian, Serbian. My my language teacher is actually Bosnian, so I guess technically I'm learning Bosnian. But for the purposes of one day applying for EU jobs, I'm technically learning Croatian because Croatian's an EU language. Um, the other one's Russian, 
or one of the others is Russian. Uh, I've been trying to learn that for about five years and it's going very slowly, but there's a lot of crossover between Croatian and Russian, so it helps with the grammar. And the other one is Farsi or Persian. Okay, okay awesome. Yeah. Well, well uh, I look forward to seeing the slow progress and uh, you get into mastery in, in a few years. Hopefully, hopefully. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you're most welcome. You're most welcome. Um, so what, what do you do? Because you said that uh, Coalition for Global Health Innovation does all these different things. What do you do as a community building coordinator? Uh, yeah, so I try and I'm one of the people who, I guess, tries to build our community, which I guess the main things I do is around in the future, trying to attract people into, into doing a project with CGHI. A lot of this year has been setting up the processes that we would eventually be using. We've currently got a pilot project with um, someone in India around health equity. So a lot of it's been, you know, piloting, making documents and making processes for how a project will work and then trying to run internal projects and just looking at all those sorts of things, very much still setting up and ground level type things. So I've mainly been coordinating that. In the future, I would be one of the people helping coordinate any amount of people who come in to try and make their own project in, in global health. Being a coordinator, I'm also on the steering group for the, the um, coalition. So, you know, we help input into what we will, where the NGO will be going in general and what we want to do in the next year and in the next five years and, and kind of putting together what content and what our scope will be those sorts of things i also you know i wrote a recent article for them those sorts of things so we all contribute in in most of the organization because there's like partnerships and there's social media and editorial and a lot of us do everything it's a very horizontal kind of organization but as the coordinator i'd mainly be of community coordinator sorry i'd mainly be charged <laughs> with um with trying to work out the processes that will eventually be kind of project Okay, awesome, awesome, and and as you said, it's like a pretty decently new organization. So so I, I bet there's a lot of uh, lifting that's going on there, and a lot of <laughs> things to come in the future for sure. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. How how do you balance uh, all these different things? It can be tough. It can be tough. I can't make all the meetings, unfortunately. Sometimes I just need a break, or I've just got a, you know, I've got a holiday planned or something, or I've just got to take some time off and do something else. Um, but yeah, it's tough. So, like, you know, the meetings, you know, I'll have kind of two, two regular meetings every fortnight with the coalition. Um, so that'll be a few hours. And then normally on a Sunday. So, you know, every second Sunday afternoon, I know I'll have a few hours where I'll be on meetings as the occasional kind of week week night meeting or, or another event kind of in here and there and you know in the background you know I'll be working and I'll hear my slack like duh, 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 go off and I look and I'm like ah, I can answer that quickly <laughs> kind of type a reply or something like that so you know I guess I guess it's just packing it in you know like I said my, my full-time job 40 hours a week that leaves a fair few hours outside of that to do things Obviously, I like socializing. I like reading and watching movies and traveling and seeing friends and all of that. But I also do very much enjoy public health and global health. So it, it kind of, it, it doesn't feel like a, a task, really, it, because the motivation and energy and enthusiasm is definitely there. But I don't know, it's just, it's, I guess, trusting that motivation that helps do it. Um, if I wasn't motivated for the work, I would find maybe quite taxing because you know every second sunday or something like that is the afternoon's taken but i am very enthused by it so it doesn't really feel that bad i guess it's just most of it's trying to convince my partner that it's a good idea <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense and yeah it, it is tough to do other things on top of your your full-time job and make speaks for all the other things that you enjoy in life but it, it is easier when you do like love the things that you are doing so there is yeah, that absolutely. and yeah. Okay, so you, you said that you all like do pilot projects with people. So if someone was interested in doing a pilot project, what's that process like for reaching out to do one? And I was asking like, well, what type of pilot projects have you, are you all doing? Because you said that you're doing one in India right now or starting up one in India. Yeah, yeah. So what we'll eventually aim to do when we get all our processes good is that we'll have you know, an open call or we'll have a section on our website where people who have an idea, you know, like someone's like, you know what we should do? We should 
we should do an initiative to do this, you know, whether it's advertising or whether it's app or whether it's some kind of technology or some kind of fundraising, I guess, or pitching or whatever, developing an idea. Someone goes, you know, that's a great idea. I wish, I wish, you know, I had the resources to do that. Then hopefully that would come to us. They would find a form on our website, they reply to an open call, and then they just fill out a form um, with all the kind of basic details of what they are proposing to do. We would review the form. This is eventually. We'd review the form. And if we think it's a good idea that it's something we can help with or collaborate with, we say yes. Ideally, we'll have, we'll set them up with all the documents. We'll say these are the, the key documents that we believe will help you form your idea. Um, you know, it's like things like a logical framework, a value proposition, those sorts of things, timelines. Um, and once that's all kind of, once the person who has brought that idea um, works all those things out, works out timelines and their scope and their goals and what their uh, deliverables and all that sort of thing are, then we would kind of set them up with our, <clears throat> our project tools and kind of put them in touch with anyone they needed, any professionals they kind of needed. Um, and also help collaborate with them. We're not, we won't kind of be doing the things for them, but we'll be collaborating and kind of helping them do it to set up their own project. Uh, our, what we kind of got at the moment is that we, we think someone will come and we'll, there'll be like a six week kind of setup period, which will be kind of regular and intense. And then after that, we kind of say, you know, we'll check in every, every month or so for a duration of time. We're still a bit undecided about how long exactly each project will go for, but we're hoping that people will come with us, come to us, will help them develop the idea. And a lot of this is driven by themselves, their own motivation. And we just try and help provide the resources and connections and networking. And then they will set their own timelines, run the project. If they want to build on that the next time, they can come back again and say, yep, I'd like to renew the project. Let's do it again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, generally, hopefully, eventually people will be able to come with their idea to our website, have it assessed, have it built upon, and then be given the resources to run with it okay awesome awesome well, thank you for sharing that and i look forward to you all getting to that that step where that process is very seamless hopefully yeah yeah thank you i appreciate that <laughs> You're thank, you thank you thank you <laughs> okay so that's all that you do in your public health career and, and stuff right now and i wanted to give you some space uh, to talk about yeah uh, i know you wanted to talk about like environmental health air pollution global inequality so here's your space to do that <laughs> yeah uh well yeah air pollution is something i've very recently been interested in i guess um yeah so my my I, know, I think my goals were probably always in global health you know i love public health but i think global health you know public health global health Often the same i think but <laughs> but i yeah i love global health i just love that kind of overarching kind of all-encompassing you know the variability the amazing kind of career options so um kind of looking towards that but yeah just you know whenever i yeah you know, my recent thing is about environmental health and climate health and air pollution and air quality within that kind of global health kind of space um i think yeah i picked air pollution because it's so easily overlooked and it's so pervasive and so dangerous you know like now i've got all these apps on my phone where i'm like monitoring the air pollute air quality and all that sort of thing and you know ireland and dublin is incredibly clean yet often goes over the who um, guidelines for air pollution and it's one of the cleaner places i think like dublin's one of the cleanest cities for air pollution in europe or something like that yet we'll still sometimes exceed the limits for the eu and the who and that's just here you know like i've been in cities like i was taking off from beijing one day and the plane kind of turned around just like at the end of the taxi the going to the runway and there was all these planes lined up behind us and i couldn't see like three or four planes down the air was just so thick with pollution you know i've seen that in india and in nepal in iran in central asia just in russia like it's awful and you know it's air you breathe it in you don't smell it and you don't taste it you think it's clean but it just shaves decades off people's lives and you know like two of the biggest outcomes of air pollution are stroke and heart attack um, and cases of stroke and heart attack and asthma and lung disease and all of that do rise when there's air pollution rising so you know both on like a population scale and also on a kind of 
day-to-day scale. If you know someone who's had a heart attack or a stroke or something, your first thought isn't going to be, what was the air pollution like, you know, three days before? It, you know, it's just, it's so, something that's so overlooked in the whole process. And I think something that's very changeable is such a great scope to just manage that. Like, it's just something that you could do to bring so much, like take so much health inequality so much premature mortality, so much disability, life years, you could just change that and change so much. So that's my bent at the moment. That's what I'm really into. Um, but yeah, everything interests me really. Energy. Probably why I keep saying yes to projects. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, there de- definitely is an issue uh, that is, is dealt with all around the world and especially in more marginalized places around the world. They just have the brunt of that and have less access to, to clean air, which, yeah. you know, is, is literally what we're, what we're breathing every day, every second, know, every millisecond that, that's going on. So, so yeah. yeah. Um, and like, even in, in Dublin too, like the, the bad air pockets are in not affluent places and the most cement is in non affluent places. The most trees are in the affluent places, you know, the most, you know, this, where the cement is is also where there's the least density of like good nutritious food. Like, and this is just one city on one small scale in a relatively equal country. Like, it's just man, when you see these horrible things that divide people around the world, you just can't help but feel like you should do whatever you can to prevent it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank thank you for raising that up. Okay, so you've had a very interesting medical into public health career. Uh, I wanted to ask, where, where do you want to see yourself in the future? Uh, well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think in global health. Like, I'm very happy where I am right now, mm-hmm. and I plan to hopefully continue this for a fair while. Um, Ireland is a very friendly place to be. My colleagues are amazing, and the work I do, I think, is really quite interesting. There's a lot to learn there. Um, and there's a lot of skills to gain. Um, I think eventually, though, I'd want to work in something more international, global health. The go-to in everyone's mind and my mind, like I'm sure everyone who works in global health's mind, et cetera, is always the, w- the World Health Organization. Um, but kind of anything kind of public health, global health, international health related in Europe slash Asia slash Middle East, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, I be quite happy with i think um you know like the reason i'm learning croatian is to be able to apply for you know work with the uh, european center for disease control for prevention and disease control ecdc because they require two european languages that's why i'm working on that who you know whatever you hear about it, i think it would be quite a prestigious role and, and you know chance to do a whole lot of good but yeah there are also other other organizations that focus on international health I mean considering you know there's a lot of UN jobs there's a lot of NGOs that work over multiple countries a lot of you know European NGOs who work in Central Asia and the Balkans and the Caucasus and then there's things like the you know the ICRC the Red Cross and Red Crescent they don't necessarily do kind of public well they do do public health but more international health and humanitarian response and more very international as well anything along those lines i haven't really worked it out yet i just kind of know vaguely the fields and it's kind of global international environmental humanitarian something along those lines so i'm hopefully setting up now for a future in that yeah i absolutely think you are i think that your experiences are very unparalleled in a lot of senses and and i'm guessing that you're going to continue to to build on those experiences and skill sets and like just your your want and knowledge to continue to grow and experience new cultures and integrate that into everything that you're learning and doing is is going to be vital and i think it shows like in in your story as well oh thanks mari appreciate that nice (laughs) of you to say (laughs) my pleasure my pleasure um (laughs) Uh, but before I move on to the Furious Five, I wanted to ask, what are you reading right now? Oh, yeah, good, good question. Um, I'm reading Labyrinths by Jorg Louis Borges, I think is his name. It's this kind of like psycho, uh, not psychological, philosophical. Oh, it's like this collection of essays and short stories about philosophical, not conundrums, but this is like self-contained stories that just make you think like, what? Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, but then up here I've got... Um, I've got a Slavoj Žižek book lined up on um, political violence. <laughs> I've got uh, the new urban crisis. Uh, I've got a history of Bosnia book there. 
And there's also this great one I want to get about this volcano that exploded in 1815 and then plunged uh, the world into two years without summer. So, and just kind of the effects of that, you know, I think that'd be interesting as well from a public health point of view and history point of view, you know, Frankenstein was written in that period and Dracula was formulated in that period and um, romanticism as an art movement and all sorts of things. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> sorry, I digress. Labyrinths <laughs> is what I'm reading <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> no, 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 whatever. I appreciate those at all. And what was the political one that you said? Um, it's called Violence by Slavoj Zizek. One second, I've got it. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. He's a Slovenian philo philosopher who is hilarious, but also very insightful. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's a, that's a good combination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right. All right. Moving on to the Furious Five. Now, five questions that I ask all guests. What advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Get in there. Just do it. All the, all the experiences you have, I think, are relevant, not even just in public health. If you're traveling, if you're you know, socializing with people, everything you do can be relevant. But, you know, I think uh, for me personally, I've had very, very good things happen, very useful things happen, and dividends paid later that I wouldn't have realized at the time, just from kind of saying yes to a lot of things, from the variety of experiences, you know, like the work I did in Georgia, I never knew it would account really, uh, would amount really to like multiple publications. Again, with the work at the university, I didn't know that would amount to publications either, but all of those things are proven useful. All these, you know, I still reflect on things I saw and people I saw and talked to in Mongolia and Nepal and Georgia and all these places, you know, daily when I, when I do my public health work, even though it's not really related, you know, it's still, it all feeds in. So I just say like, you know, just get out there, do whatever you can, do whatever interests you. It's all relevant. It all comes together in the end and helps create you as a person and you as a employee, if you want to think about it like that, but you as a, a public health worker. Yeah, I cannot agree with, with that anymore because like it's it's all about life experiences. I feel like in public health, as you're taking everything as well as like the experiences yeah. just like in like academics and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. And like yourself, I'm sure you know you reflect on your experiences in Alaska quite often. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I feel like those those type of like recognition it, it helps me to to form the superpower of like just cultural understanding and exactly like, yeah, which is which is a huge huge thing in public health as well like been very beneficial to me in my career so far yeah 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 absolutely absolutely seeing that other side of things seeing another point of view it's invaluable yeah okay number two if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position what advice would you give them i guess i guess prepare prepare for it get the practical experience like with my position in particular like when i did the interview for this position a lot of it was very much asking questions about how i would actually do the job which is, you know, how I would go about talking to someone who I need to talk to about an infectious disease or something like that. And having kind of that knowledge, but also that kind of communication skills and those, I don't want to say document, documentation skills or anything like that, but, you know, knowing those kind of processes, how you approach situations and how you analyze situations and how you integrate things that you know from your practice and from your other lives and all of that into managing a public health need so I was lucky when I actually interviewed for the for the full-time position I guess or like for a, a permanent contract I'd been doing the job but so many of the questions they asked were about the actual practice of doing the job so <clears throat> I guess it's hard going into a job and not having done the job to be asked how are you going to do the job but like I could have, I could have answered a lot of those questions with similar things from other positions. Like I could have answered a lot of the medical questions from my medical background, could have answered a lot of the public health audit and research questions from my research um, backgrounds and that. So I guess just having that preparation, knowing kind of where you need to get to and what you would need to set up in the meantime to get there, um, I think would be invaluable. Yeah, it's the main thing, preparing for it. And again, doing things being practical and getting out there and doing things. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that. Number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Hmm. Uh, a few things, I guess. Um, I'm on a very 
very basic sense. I'm trying to get a little fitter. Went to the pool this morning, even though it was two degrees and windy. I got out there on my bike and rode to the swimming pool and went for a swim this morning. I'm trying to be a little more uh, fit, I guess, because of, you know, lockdown, you know, you sit at home, you, you jump, you watch TV. So <laughs> I'm trying to break that a little bit. Um, I guess I'm trying in general, like mentally, to be a bit more mindful, uh, a bit more considerate. I guess, you know, it might be also something with the pandemic. You're doing a lot of thinking, sitting at home, reflecting, introspecting. So I guess I'm just trying to be a bit more mindful about the world and about how I act around people, how I interact with people. I have I have some friends who are younger than me. They kind of they kind of replicate how I was a few years ago, and I can see that I'm I'm not like that anymore. And I'm I'm glad that I've taken the time to work myself, not being like that. You know, being kind of happy with happy with the way you present yourself, and not kind of trying too hard to present 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 this image of yourself um trying not too hard to be you know something a kind of curated image um, of yourself i guess professionally and knowledge wise i'm trying to build my you know ongoing battle to kind of build my uh, global health knowledge my epidemiology and all of that but also from a practical point of view trying to build you know skills that i hope will be useful later you know i want to be good at good at kind of assessing and managing, you know, infectious outbreaks in, you know, the local sense in the job I do. And then hopefully one day, if it comes to it, I'll be able to apply those on other levels. And, you know, if I get to a position in global health and, um, you know, I'm working with I don't know, AMR, you know, antimicrobial resistance, I will have had that hospital experience, I will have had the public health experience. And so the practical experience, I'm kind of building now the public health thing so that one day I will be hopefully knowledgeable. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing that as well. All good, all good. Yeah. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? I don't know, it depends. It depends on how, how you like to do it. So like um, right now, you know, I listen to a podcast by the ECDC. That's my main one that I listen to for like public health, like international public health kind of updates. That colleague of mine, he has a YouTube channel I often watch, um, which is which is great. I don't know, like in terms of books and all of that, I don't think, like obviously when you're studying public health, you know, you'll have all those textbooks, theoretical kind of things. But what I've found useful, like again, what I've found so useful in professionally is things that aren't textbooks or theoretical, like, um, I don't know, I guess like a lot of political, political history type things are always very useful. Because, you know, like in... In Europe at the moment, you can see a kind of quite clear division in vaccine hesitancy based on trust in the government and countries that had really repressive governments don't have trust in the government. So like the past political choices in history are now affecting like individual health now, like 30 years later. So so it's kind of like soft. It's not like defined. I think that reading around those kind of broad concepts and those edges can help so much professionally yeah i just find that really interesting how it can kind of have that intersection yeah i I think that's good insights i think uh history does repeat itself or shows itself but there definitely are patterns in there and that's that's one thing like my boss does he he knows like a lot about history especially history in like north carolina where we are and that that context that he brings definitely is very very useful in the work that that we do so i appreciate that and what's your what's your friend's youtube channel uh so it's um Global Health with Greg Martin or Dr. Greg Martin, Global Health. Um, anyway, type in Greg Martin on YouTube, you'll find him. Yeah. Got about 100,000 subscribers, quite a lot going on. Um, I, think it's, I think it's Global Health and Greg Martin, yeah. But he's got oh, a yeah. lot of project going on, so there's always something <laughs> happening. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. And, and that's, that's the same uh, YouTube that you were on, right? Correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. it is. Awesome, awesome. Okay, well, I appreciate you sharing that as well. Um, oh, okay. And then last but not least, where can people connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's probably the best way. I, that's where I put all my kind of professional stuff. Of course, I have an Instagram and all of that. But that's just for the occasional photo, really. I don't really do much on there, but LinkedIn. LinkedIn's my main one. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Kale, and uh, sh- sharing your story and your insights and your very unique path in public health. Uh, I definitely appreciate it, and I think everyone else is going to appreciate it as well. Oh, thanks, Mario. It's really nice of you to say. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun.
fun chatting with you. Really, really yeah. great time. Thanks. Awesome. And awesome, awesome. Well, uh, hopefully I can make it out there to Dublin, Ireland sometime. Yeah, <laughs> awesome 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 uh so some housekeeping items for everyone thank you so much for watching and listening be sure to subscribe if you have not as yet be sure to leave a review if you have not about if you have not as yet it helps the show get out to more people leave a like if you're watching this on youtube and be sure to share with a friend you can support by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ph millennial or the ph millennial.com forward slash support uh thank you all and i will see you all next week